Around the world, thousands of policies are drafted every day. The science that supports them is an important tool that affects the final policy products. We will be comparing two different policies, both international and domestic, and the science that supports them. In particular, our discussion is based on governmental ambient air quality science and satellite data on deforestation. Based on the state of pollution in China and the United States, how do these countries regulate health damaging pollution and are their policies effective? In the case of the United States, ambient air quality regulations have been relatively effective. In the case of China, there is adequate regulation of health damaging pollution, however, the standards are continually not met and are therefore ineffective. The state of pollution in the United States is one of regulation through the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA has put in place certain standards for six pollutants that have been recognized to have serious health effects. The pollutants included are NOx, ozone, PM10, PM2.5, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and lead. These standards are updated periodically as more science becomes accepted. Through the Clean Air Act, the EPA regulates pollution levels based on primary and secondary standards. Thus far, these regulations have been successful in the United States. China regulates according to classifications. A blue sky day is a classification in which a particular city meets the air quality standard for any pollutant. China publicly reports the number of blue sky days achieved per year. These public reports are relatively new as they became available in the late 1990s. Due to communist control of the government, these reports were not publicly disclosed earlier. Besides the blue sky day classification, there are also different category levels of pollution. They are referred to as classes or grades. Grade 1 are the levels at which there is no harm to human health or ecosystems. Grade 2 are the levels believed to be threshold concentrations for effects on ecosystems and human health. Grade 3 are the poisonous levels that require protection of people and ecosystems. The government at different levels, local, regional, and central, sets the grades for a particular area. Of China's 560 million urban residents, only 1% breathe air considered safe by European Union standards. The health implications of poorly restricted emissions could be extremely destructive to the Chinese people. So where should the policy line be drawn? In a world where politics is always in play, to shed favorable light on one's own pollution triumphs in policy is of course beneficial. However, the implications of scientific data that is untrue or only seen through a certain political view is destructive. One thing is obvious. Science has a definite role of promoting the overall goals of whoever is employing it. It would be ideal, of course, if science could function in the way it was intended, a resource of data unaffected by politics or personal aspirations, but in reality that does not occur all the time. 20% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions are alone from tropical deforestation. In Indonesia and Brazil, approximately 70% and 80% of their total emissions are from deforestation, bringing them to numbers 3 and 4 in top global emitters right behind China and the United States. In December 2009, at the United Nations Conference in Copenhagen, a program called RED, standing for Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Degradation, was discussed for implementing. Deforestation and degradation would be monitored and measured through satellite data and compensation would be given for reduction of carbon emissions. My question is, is satellite data sufficient enough to be used to measure compliance with this program? A major concern is the accuracy and completeness of the data produced. Currently, random errors are as high as 20%. Without high-quality satellites and other advancements, there will not be enough certainty to carry on run. Another problem is the availability of the data. At this time, NASA's most used satellite Landsat 7, shown here, has problems with its long-term acquisition plan as well as cloud cover and degradation mapping. A new satellite system is being developed called LIDAR that would help fix some of these problems using 3D imaging. Another major issue is the money and institutions that would be needed to make RED successful. Many developing countries don't have appropriate funding to comply with RED, but with the help of developed countries, this could be solved. Although the cost is high, monitoring deforestation without satellite data would be near impossible due to costs and time. In conclusion, with technological advances and global investments, satellite data is the most efficient method to monitor RED. 
A multi-resolution, multi-scale structure would be recommended for each country individually. The crucial problem is the crucial problem is not that the data is technically inadequate or incapable, but the policy itself and the lack of political willingness to make something happen. These two examples show the wide range of policies and the science that can affect them, whether the policy is domestic or international or in regards to air or energy, the science must be certain and accurate before the policy is accepted.